versus the sluggard. Let's see who wins the battle. The question is who wins, wins the battle in our own lives, <laughs> right? And uh, the first time I spoke on this passage was at Seacoast Christian School many years back. And uh, it's a good one to speak with kids about because you want the kids to be industrious in their schoolwork and encourage them to not be slothful and to be diligent, to work their hardest and be the best they can be and to go on to try to get good grades if they can and, and that type of thing. But this passage is just as good for us. Again, interesting, kind of funny in a way, but a very serious problem addressed, the problem of laziness. Verse 6, and Lord, we pray, speak to us from your word. Thank you. We know you've put this passage in the scripture because many of us do tend to be lazy. All of us, at different times, we tend to not want to do the work. So help us, Lord, to receive this teaching with a good heart, and thank you for it, that you've given it to us in your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? <laughs> when will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a bandit and scarcity like an armed man. May God bless the reading of his word. Ant versus the sluggard, and I think there's that battle within our lives. Both are there, and sometimes it depends on what we're doing. If it's something we don't want to do, we tend to be the sluggard. If it's something we like to do, we'll tend to be the ant because we kind of enjoy it, and we're doing it. We're working hard at it. A good example would be guys with sports. It's amazing how hard guys will work at the sport they love, but get home and refuse to do, ever do the dishes, right? <laughs> so it depends a little bit on what we're doing here. And we can bring this out in terms of a spiritual sense. We don't want to be sluggards spiritually, right? So we'll see that application. Old story I read goes something like this. A farmer and his wife were sitting in front of the fireplace one evening, just whiling away the time and after a long silence, the wife said, Jed, I think it's raining. Can you get up and go outside and see? Old Jed continued to gaze into the fire for a second. He sighed, and then he said, oh, Ma, why don't we just call in the dog and see if he's wet? <laughs> it's too hard to have to get up out of my easy chair. Of course, farmers a lot of times have earned the right to rest because that's a tough job, right, being a farmer, especially the old-time farmers. But we can relate to that story. We can tend to be a little lazy. Can I get an amen? Uh, we as Americans, I think, because we've been blessed in this country, and we have so much, and we have affluence that much of the world doesn't know, and it can bring out a laziness, and I think it has in our culture, and a dependence upon others and a dependence upon government, and it's not a good thing. So first, and our outline will be simple tonight, uh, you know, God wants to correct this common problem. Number one, admire the ant. Number two, shun the sluggard. In other words, be like the ant and don't be like the sluggard. So let's go to number one uh, here and we'll talk about the ant. Admire the ant. Aren't they amazing creatures? And the passage, when you look at verse six, is saying, go outside, find an out ant colony. Instead of stopping on them all or spraying bug spray, stop and look at those ants. And what do you see when you look at those ants? You see industriousness. You see hard work constantly working. They're not sitting around watching television. They're not sitting around sipping lemonade. I mean, they are working. They're not dozing off. They're very resourceful and very tenacious. Um, and I'll share a few facts about ants just for fun here. Ant colonies range in size uh, to highly organized colonies that may occupy large uh, territories, consist of millions of individual ants. Colonies, colonies have been described as super organisms in themselves because of the way, a pant, the way ants work together, almost as one organism, accomplishing their goals. Uh, ants have colonized every landmass on Earth except for Antarctica and a few remote islands. And they have division of labor, communication, ability to solve complex problems. I read that uh, many ants can carry 50 times their own body weight, so I figured I'd take somebody who weighs about 150 that would mean that you could pick up 7,500 pounds <laughs> if you're around that weight. And look at them. 
but they're, they're very, very muscular. They have thick muscles, and they can carry uh, this incredible amount of weight. Total biomass of ants on the earth equals, or is roughly equal to the total biomass of humans on the earth. That's how many ants there are. <laughs> Uh, ants enslave other ants and have been known to raid other colonies and, and round up slaves for their own colony. They're in competition with other colonies at times. At other times, these ant farms can stretch on for miles, even thousands of miles, all working together. Amazing. And they, of course, they follow trails, as you know. And the way that works is they'll send out their forager ants, and they find a trail into your kitchen where your crumbs are, and then they leave down pheromones so other ants can follow, but, the, but when the ant comes, after the first ant finds your crumbs, he goes straight back to it, because he may weave back and forth looking for food, weaving all over, ends up in your kitchen, finds it, then they go straight back to the colony. Like a dog, they know how to go back to their colony. They get a straight route back, and then the other, and that's where they lay down their pheromones, and the other ants can come along and just go straight to that spot in your kitchen until the source is gone. So they may only eat your crumbs to a point. I mean, when the crumbs are gone, you may not see them anymore. So Sometimes you have ants and then they just kind of disappear because they got all the food. So, so you don't have to sweep your floor. Just let the ants get it, and then they'll be gone when it's gone. <laughs> so they are amazing. Let's look at this text, verse 7. It has no commander or guide. They do have queens, but no overseer or ruler. They just know what to do. Depending on what their function is, they do what they need to do. Yet they store their provisions in summer and gather their food to harvest. This is true. Ants do this. They prepare uh, Proverbs 30, 25, ants are creatures of little strength, apparently, to look at, you would think. Yet they store up their food in the summer, tiny, itty-bitty creatures, but they work ahead, they stockpile, they plan for the future. And, uh, and I know that we are sometimes hardworking, and uh, you think of that farmer, I mean, he, that's a hard-working job, right, if you were, if you travel throughout our area, you see these incredible stone walls, especially the old ones, and you think, yeah, those were all built by hand, just guys clearing stones out of their fields, rolling them to the edge, putting them in a wall so it would keep the cows in, all done by hand back in the day, right, before tractors and things. Maybe they had an ox or something that would help them. But so much hard work in that type of economy, and that's true in Bible times, in an agrarian or agricultural economy, but we don't live in that kind of economy, and you can get away with not working, right, even if you're working. You could be punched into the clock and be asleep behind the pallets, right? <laughs> and these are the kind of guys that get fired if they get caught, but people try to do this. People can be very lazy, even people that are supposedly on the clock. But hard, you know, laziness is nothing new. It was common in Bible times. There were always, have always been the sluggard. I'll quote 2 Thessalonians. Remember, Paul addresses this in the early church. Paul looked out there in Thessalonica and saw lazy Christians there. And so he writes... In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching. You yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden. We did this not because we did not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. And here's that famous verse. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, if a man will not work, he shall not eat. We are to work for our food. That's what Paul writes to Thessalonica. Now, you know this old saying, the idle hands are the devil's playground. You think that's true? They certainly can be, right? Maybe if we have a lot of free time, we read good Christian books, but we could still be being labor, <laughs> lazy, right? But it's true. I mean, I, God knows we need to work. And he sets work before us. I do believe, I agree with the Puritans, the Puritan work ethic, that all work is honorable. We saw this documentary I recommended on Martin Luther. It's been on PBS. It's a two-hour special. Amazing. Very good. Very good. Very, very, very good. Not Martin Luther King Jr., but Martin Luther, the Reformation, going back to the 1500s. And he adhered to this principle as one of his teachings, and he saw this, and the early church didn't see this. The Catholic church didn't see it, that all work is honorable. And you serve the Lord by the work you do, whether it's washing floors or preaching the gospel or you're a missionary 
or you fix you know, wagons or cars. So it's all honorable. It's an honorable thing to have the health to be able to work. And praise God for a strong arm and a smart mind so that we can do things. And uh, even Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. Our work is done when we get to glory. So if we have to sweat a little bit here, it's okay. A day will come when there's no more work, just, just praising the Lord and serving him. And I didn't put it in the order of service tonight, but you remember that hymn, Work for the Night is Coming, old hymn. Work through the morning hours. Work while the dew is sparkling. Work mid springing flowers. Work when the day goes better. Work in the glowing sun. Work for the night is coming when man's work is done. This is the place here on earth for us to do our work. So admire the ant. And that's a good example of what ants can do. They are amazing creatures. They work together, lifting heavy weight. It almost, I don't know, this, this is probably a drawing, but it, but maybe they're making a bridge, right? So all the rest of the ants can come across and get the food source. Let's go to the next one. But shun the sluggard. This will take just a little longer because there's a lot in the book of Proverbs about good old Garfield, right? Good example of a sluggard. <laughs> How long will you lie there, Garfield? When will you get up from your sleep? Verse 9. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? So the Book of Proverbs telling us that this is the characteristic of the sluggard. They like to sleep, this fellow. Uh, and he's described in great detail. We'll look at a few of these. Look at Proverbs, and some of these are kind of funny, I think. Look at Proverbs 20, verse 4. That's a very big topic in Proverbs. What do you think of this one? Proverbs 20, verse 4. A sluggard does not plow in season, so at harvest time he looks but finds nothing. You know, he's like he's hoping that you know, maybe somebody else planted his fields for him, or maybe the crops are just going to miraculously come up. So along comes harvest, everybody else's corn is coming, and he looks out, and he's got nothing. Oh, that's right. Gee, I didn't plant anything, <laughs> right? The law of sowing and reaping is always in effect, right? What we sow, that shall we reap. He didn't sow anything. He's not going to reap anything. Go to chapter 21. The uh, sluggard described in great detail. 21, verse 25 the sluggard's craving will be the death of him because his hands refuse to work. And maybe his craving is just to sleep all the time, and just to relax and rest and to not do anything. And of course, again, agricultural economy, it could spell his very doom, his death. Go over to chapter 22. Here we find a few here. Or, no, actually, just one right here. And then we get to chapter 26. But chapter 22, verse 13, maybe right across the page there in your Bible. The sluggard says, and this is found a couple places in Proverbs, there's a lion outside. I'll be murdered in the streets. Oh, no. There's criminals out there. There's lions. I better stay indoors today. I better not go down to the, to the workplace. I better just be home. I'll be a lot safer if I stay home. Remember the old saying, nothing ventured, nothing gained. There is risk in going out your front door, but we have got to do it, right? Amen. How about, now go to chapter 26. There's a few in chapter 26 that are right in a row. Easy to find. 26, 14. How about this one? As a door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard turns on his bed. <laughs> I sleep on the left side, sleep on the right side, sleep on my back, sleep on my stomach, then back around, left side, right side, sleep on my back, back around, sleeping, and then morning comes, shut off the alarm, keep sleeping, right up to lunchtime, keep sleeping, turning back and forth. That's the sluggard. How about verse 15? The sluggard, I like this one. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish. He's too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. <laughs> He's falling asleep. You'd think most of us like to eat, right? This guy's so lazy, he doesn't even have enough energy to eat. He just said, uh, let's go back to bed. I don't need breakfast. <laughs> if you want to make me breakfast in bed, maybe I'll eat something. But other than that, I mean, I'm, I'm going to just stay. That's the sluggard. How about verse 16? The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who answer discreetly. He's so wise in his own eyes. He thinks he's got it all together. In reality, he's just plain what? Lazy. Go back to chapter 6. So those are some good cross-references on the sluggard. And let's go look, look at verse 10, Proverbs 6.10. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a bandit, and scarcity like an armed man. And in Bible times, this clearly was true. You know, that economy, 
if you're lazy, your farm is not going to produce, and you're not going to be able to feed your family. And when the weather's right and it's that time of year, you've got to get things planted. When it's time for harvest, you've got to get out there and harvest. And we still have some working farms in our area. I like to go out, uh, I think it's Blackberry Hill Road out of Berwick. If you go out there, there's several farms out there. They have beautiful, beautiful corn this year. Just corn, almost as far as the eye can see in one of those fields out there. And they had a great year for it, but they've got to harvest it, right? It's a lot of work. Uh, not too long ago, I went by a blueberry, those high bush blueberries. And the guys were out there harvesting by hand, a lot of work. They maybe they have machines for this, but on this farm, they were just harvesting them by hand. It's a lot of work to bring in all those blueberries. And, you know, they all get ready to be picked at the same time. And, you know, and so back in potato season, back in Maine, I guess, you know, they'd even get the kids out there working because it's harvest time. You've got to go to work. Today, in our economy, except for agricultural America, we have so many state programs, federal, local programs, even churches that provide help for those who are poor that it doesn't tend to promote industry. And this is a big problem with the welfare system and our, all of our food pantries and things. We want to help people that are hurting financially and they don't have enough food. On the other hand, we don't want to promote laziness. And it can happen. You, and you, we probably all know people have decided maybe not to marry because if they marry, they lose their benefits, right? That's not right, is it? It's, 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 no matter which way you look at it, it seems like society wants to encourage marriage, you know, not people living together. This is a problem. These are things that need to be worked out by the politicians uh, so that we can have responsible programs that help the people who are truly in need but aren't helping those who are just being lazy and trying to get out of work. Um, so, you know, and then you, and maybe some of us have even experienced this, where you're in this position where you do get benefits and you can work a certain number of hours, but if you work more than that, you lose your benefits. So by working more, you actually earn less, you know what I'm saying? But that's not right. We, you know, the Bible wants to encourage us to be hardworking people, but we should help the needy. That's, I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't have these programs. But they have to be well administrated so that we can encourage this teaching in Scripture. So diligence, industry, productivity, and spiritual fruitfulness, too. So let's talk about that in regard to this teaching. We want to be spiritually fruitful, not just have our farms be fruitful. Our lives need to be fruitful for the Lord. Remember the parable of the talents? Let's take a quick look at it, Matthew 25. It is kind of a long parable, so we'll kind of skim it. Matthew 25 but I think it's worth, and there's a few parables we could look at tonight, but I picked this one. It's probably the most relevant. So Matthew 25, uh, here, verse 14. And you probably remember the story, so we can go down through it quick. But a man was going to take a journey, he called his servants, and he trusts his property to them. And to one he gave the five talents, to another the two, and to another just the one talent. And, of course, the man with the five, he put the money to work, and he got five more. Then verse 17, you have the one with the two. Even he did well. He got two more. But you have this other man, verse 18, the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. This is not good, right? Now remember, we get our word talent today from this parable. We have talents. We have spiritual gifts. We do not want to dig a hole and put them in the ground. That's laziness. I don't want to be that active in my church, right? I don't want to get out there and do things for the Lord. I'd rather just stay home. After a long time, the master, of course, verse 9, he returns. He settles accounts with them. And the talent, according to the NIV study Bible, the term talent was first used for a unit of weight about 75 pounds. So if that's what this refers to, this was a huge investment. Even the one with the one would have had perhaps 75 pounds of silver that was entrusted to him by a very wealthy man. It did become uh, the term for a unit of coinage. But the indication is that this would have been a large amount that were given to these, one five, one two, and one uh, one. So of course, this is where we get that famous verse, verse 21, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Wouldn't we all love to hear that in glory? We've been faithful. And we can share in our master's happiness through eternity. Again, the man with the two, same thing. Well done. 
But then verse 24, the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. And I went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. So he did return to him what was given to him. You might say, well, at least he had that much responsibility. He didn't lose it. He didn't spend it. But he didn't invest it, and he didn't multiply it. He didn't really use it. it just, he just watched it. And that's laziness, isn't it? His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. That verse there has always got me. What a thing. Would the Lord, you know, we often like to quote, oh, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But some people are going to hear this, you wicked, lazy servant. I don't know if they're saved or unsaved. So you knew that I harvest women and so forth. You should have at least put my money on deposit, verse 27, with the bankers. And, of course, they take the talent from him and give it to the others. And verse 29 is our key to the truth here. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has, will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what's the lesson of that parable? If you had to get it down to a sentence, because it's a long parable, what's the point, Lord? Don't be lazy. That gets it down to three words. The point is we need to invest our talents, right? I, th I think it's fairly obvious. God expects a return on the investment he gives us, right? Because a master, I think, represents God in the parable. He expects us to bring a return to him. And only laziness, I think, will keep from bringing that return because he put it in us. He gave us our talents. He gave us our spiritual gifts. You know, he will fill us with our spirit if we ask him. He will give us wisdom to know how to use it. It's just laziness that would result in, and in this case, maybe it was fear. He was afraid, right? He's afraid of his master. Uh, would, re would mean that we didn't produce. So, again, a little sleep, a little slumber. I'm going to add a word. A little folding of the hands to rest and spiritual poverty, poverty will come on you like a bandit, and spiritual scarcity like an armed man. We need to be diligent about our spiritual lives and our spiritual fruitfulness. We can't expect it to just happen. We've got to get out there and invest it. So in the natural realm, of course, verse 10, verse 11 is talking about a literal poverty, but I think we can apply it spiritually. And you might remember Jesus saying this before we wrap it up. Um, Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service, from Luke 12, and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. Isn't that a wonderful verse to think? At some point, the master is blessed that we've been hard about his business, and he will dress himself, as he did, remember he washed the disciples' feet, it's almost that kind of picture, and have us recline, you take this verse literally, and Jesus himself will come and serve. And I think only a very few, only a few very special servants to the Lord will know the truth of that verse in glory. That's one of those verses that I don't think is for everybody. It's for certain ones who have served well in this life, and they might experience that place at the table where the Lord Jesus himself comes to serve them. Amazing. So let's go to that closing slide, and uh, yeah, just, you know, the question. <laughs> uh, which one are you? So admire the ant. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Interesting that the passage, when you look at Proverbs 6, assumes that we are sluggards, right? Am I right? Because that's who it's written to. <laughs> it's in all of us. But So admire the ant, you sluggish, lazy one. Stop, pause, consider its ways, and be wise. Even this tiny little creature can get so much done. You too are a tiny creature, but you're bigger than an ant, and you can get a lot done. Can't lift a car, probably. You know, that's what it would be equal to lifting like two cars to what ants can do. But we can do things spiritually, of course, ants cannot too. Be like them, be hardworking in material, physical sense, I think, providing for our families and so forth and uh, keeping our homes in order and doing all those things, but then the spiritual sense. And shun the sluggard. And when I say that, shun the sluggard, I mean the sluggard that's in me, right? We have to shun the sluggard that's in all of us. This tendency to be lazy, the tendency to want to leave the work to other people, uh, the one who wants to rest and relax and sleep away the day and doesn't get motivated. And I know sometimes as we get older we say, I don't have the energy. I think there's a little secret here. You get the energy by doing something. <laughs> In other words, you'll feel like you have no energy if you do nothing. 
But I've, I found this to be true. If we get out and do something, then the energy kind of comes along as we get active, as we get busy. No, we don't feel like doing it at the start. We feel like we have no energy. But once you get out in the garden, right, or mowing the lawn or whatever it is that we need to do, handing out tracts, whatever it would be, the energy comes along because that's the way our bodies are made. Our bodies are made to work. Remember the Ten Commandments. Six days shalt thou work. Only one is a day off. We do get a day off, praise the Lord. <laughs> For me, it's Sunday. I mean, I'd like it to be Sunday, although it's a very busy day for me. I kind of blend it with a couple other days, but, but six days. The other six are to be days of work. It's right in the Ten Commandments. So, Lord, we rebuke that sluggard within, amen, and we present ourselves to you that you might fill us with your spirit and empower us to serve you. And we pray you would help us to use our talents and gifts for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.